Today is September 17th, and the boys from the back pocket are present. Andy Cycles, how we doing, dude? Decky Dates, how we doing? We're living it, dude. It's September 17th. It's my favorite day right now because I'm just in the present moment. How many times have we said the date already? And it's minute five, minute five-ish, minute four-ish? Yeah, let's reinforce it. People are probably listening to this like in November of 2018 or like maybe March. Shout out March of 2019. Or what about April of... 2022 oh we got some old listeners shout out to the 2022s man like that's what it's all about Mm -hmm. but nonetheless we're here we're excited and we're ready to deliver some real content for you we got a big guest we got stationary astronaut nick should we say his last name i don't know he's hesitant about it it's always confuses me nick stationary astronaut let's just say it and if if he doesn't want us to say it then we'll just bleep this out but nick mclaughlin with stationary astronaut dudes a stud absolutely loved his story you heard him and all about what he did when declan went through the whole adventure of going to get me gary v event hosted in rochester minnesota he is the man behind the curtain that threw this entire event he got gary v to come to his event he got Theo Vaughn to come to his event, Giselle Ugardi. I mean, the man is an absolute stud. You'll, we'll get to that content and we'll dive into his story. But before we do, if you're here in March of 2019 or of April of 2022, you know what the drill is at this point. Average quality. Let's start it off. Declan, what's our average quality on September 17th, 2018? Absolutely. So our average quality is the – it's – My recognition and probably your recognition, but thank God we've recognized it, is our inabilities and how well they go together. So my average quality is when I'm given a series of tasks that are either, you know, they're not very hard or they're they're not arbitrary. They're just these direct tasks. If I'm given 10 of them, I have a tough time prioritizing and then getting them all done as efficiently as possible. My inability... I feel like allies with the arbitrary task. Okay. So you tell me to find a job and I am going to be lost. I'm going to do my best to try to figure out. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to work less harder. Or Is that how you say it? Less harder. Work. You're not I'm not going to work as hard. And uh, or no, I will. You'll work really hard trying to find the job, but you're just not efficient at it. Is what uh, you're cor- correct. I'm okay. not as efficient as I would be is if you tell me I need you to get these five things done of create a video for social media get this portion of the business plan done um tell uh get the bank account ready Mm -hmm. like you tell me those three tasks and i will be able to figure that out or i'll be able to do it because it's just a follow step by step i'm i feel like i'm killer at those type of tasks right where i'm weak you're strong where you're weak i'm strong Mm -hmm. if i said that right because i think when someone says like hey get up get us a podcast guest for this week or hey, let's start connecting with these types of people, or hey, let's put ourselves in front of this person or that person. That's where I see myself as like a networking person who is trying to like find the best route. I think my those arbitrary tasks are the ones where I crush it. Absolutely. I think it goes along the lines, and you'll hear Nick talk about this, is the confidence aspect. Mm -hmm. You have tremendous confidence in yourself talking to new people. You're very comfortable in your own skin of being who you are, and you can relate to a lot of people in that way. Um, maybe I, I, I see myself as not as good. Maybe I'm good. I don't know. But I don't see myself as effective as you are with the with this because sometimes I come off as a little too serious in new situations. Mm-hmm. Like that's my initial go-to first impression is to be super mannered, straight up forward, eye contact, shake their hand firmly. Like that's just my go-to thing in my head right. instead of just taking a deep breath and being like, it's just another human being, you know? It's just a conversation. It's just right? a conversation. Yeah, it's, it's not a job interview or maybe yes. it is, right? Um, but I think there's positives to that too because you got to look at your, your manners and how well you present yourself to people you know that stuff's also very important where some people may look at my uh, casual approach to it as like a turnoff and like obviously those people i probably won't vibe with or connect with as much you know and that's why you and i are the back pocket because we know how to vibe with each other 
we're totally opposite personalities. We had an off-air conversation here about 10 minutes ago, and the tension was real. I mean, no wrong. Like, we were having just a normal conversation, but each of us were trying to get our voices heard and our opinions um, laid out in a in a way that was understanding for the other person. And we were having a hard time. Like, yo, are you listening to what I'm saying? Or no, wait, are you listening to what I'm saying? And it was just funny because that's just how you and I react. Like we have our strong opinions, but they're different. And then we have different personalities within them. But because of that, we have a def, a a flow chart. That's totally unique collaboration because it's the opposite sides. Exactly, dude. It's like, it's like an Oklahoma drill between Luke Keekley and Adrian Peterson. Like, two dudes that are just badass at what they do, and they collide right there, and there's a lot of energy, right? There's How do you harness that energy? How do you turn it into a, a positive, right? You you have two views, right, that are both – one's really good, one's really good. And we'll clash every once, every once in a while because we're both educated on whatever we're talking about. We're going to find a solution that's going to fit us – the podcast, the LLC, all these March of 2022 people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyways, we're going to find a way. We're going to find a solution. We've done it ever since we've been born, right? Mm-hmm. So, hey, leverage leverage those those heated conversations. Be thankful for them because I'm always thankful for them. Absolutely. And if you're in a position where you're either at the top and you're crushing it, you've, you've been crushing it and you want to grow, I hope we're here for you. But this podcast is really directed towards – those people that are struggling and their lower level employees, lower level in their um, their voices, whether it's just being a student or whether it's being in a family, a large family, and you're mm-hmm. struggling to get your voice heard and you're just struggling with the day by day process. This podcast is directed primarily towards you guys because you got this. Just know that it's in you. You have an ability to grow, and we want to share with you. So this segment right here is called "Starting from the Bottom" or "Building Up." Um, cool. Starting from scratch. Yeah. One of those. I like all those. Mm -hmm. What can be, we'll we'll figure it out later. But this is the people at the bottom and looking for an opportunity to grow and actually growing. And we have some stories behind that. Absolutely. So to start, we were inspired by Nick and how he started his story, you know, from the bottom. He built a brand, you know, the name, he built the name and he built the belief, right? You look at Nick and you're like, okay, how does this, how did this guy get from, you know, being an ex-felon to getting Gary Vaynerchuk to come to Rochester, Minnesota for a talk, right? There's a story behind that, but it was the belief, the mindset, the confidence to get him there. Look at us right now and look at the medium that we're in. We're in podcasting. We're the pod, back pocket podcast and Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell, dude, nice. The list goes on. All these people are all using this podcast medium, but they built their brand elsewhere. What are we? A podcast. Right. We're building our brand, our belief, our confidence through the podcast medium. There's not a lot of people doing that right now. I don't think you, if you can, and I'd love to hear this, if there's someone out there that has made the status of someone like Tim Ferriss through starting through a podcast. I would love to find them. I would love to learn from them. Um, They need to be talked about and they need to, I want to just have an opportunity to grow with that person. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think what we're doing right now, it might not be unique, but in our eyes, we don't see anyone out there doing it right now. I believe it truly is unique. We are building a brand that in itself is unique that's so cool i don't know like how i haven't really thought about that in a long time until we were talking about it with clay bertilek who's who's got brio formerly yo eats he was on the podcast beginning of season two go check that out link in below on our youtube page um so he was he was kind of um, describing how you know brio is an app that people need to see in a multi fashion and needs to be uh, the name needs to have like a formality to it that people will want to download the app and yo eats wasn't necessarily what he wanted with that train of thought mm-hmm. and then he was talking about how back pocket you guys are creating what that is like everything behind back pocket is generated through our content mm-hmm. no one knows what what it is otherwise it can be anything right and that's the whole point where it's like you're starting from scratch. The bat, like there was nothing, nothing that the back pocket podcast stood for before February of 2017. Nothing. Nothing, dude. What? And 
people would argue that in May of 2017, what the pack, like what the back pocket podcast was, was hardly nothing in the scope of the universe. Probably. And you know what? You could even argue the same thing now. But what it feels like over that this whole year and six months or whatever it is, it's grown to something. That's something that we talk about so much and reinforce all the time that it's built into people's brains now. That the Back Pocket Podcast, Back Pocket LLC, whatever you want to call us, whatever we are at the time, stands for Andrew and Declan, which is cool. And a message, though, more importantly. Absolutely. The message, man. And, you know, I love reiterating this fact. This is just a couple of dudes out here speaking into a mic, trying to spread some positivity. That's what about growth and development. Mm Mm-hmm positivity and growth and development that's what it is at the end of the day and we don't really know exactly what we're talking about this is nothing we're not saying this is the way this is just saying this is how we're doing it and this is how we've had other people on our show talk about how they're doing it and if you can grab something from there and become a better person become a better um employee then do it then then thank then then you're not you're welcome but thank you for joining us you know like that's so cool and it's just ordinary dudes talking into a mic Mm-hmm. We're just a couple bojangles bojangling around, dude. Just being a bunch of suckers out here. Bunch of big boys, man. Big boy. <laughs> you know the drill, man. But hey, I enjoyed that time right there. I think you guys need to get to this interview right now. It's a little long, but the story, the golden nuggets, they are all there and they are present. And we're, I'm just stoked for you guys to listen to this one. Me too. Do we want to give them a brief framework? Yeah. So I believe this podcast has tremendous flow of a casual conversation of just three people sitting down and talking. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a lot of topics that we covered and it may seem sporadic to you, to us. You know, we felt like we were doing a great job at structuring, but I don't know how it's going to look to someone um, new to this conversation. That's how it always feels. But this one may be a little bit more than others. Um, Nick is an incredible storyteller. So enjoy his and voice inflection because that's one of the coolest things he's a podcaster himself stationary astronaut um and he was on fire when he was talking to us i felt like he, he spoke into the mic more than i've ever seen anyone speak into the mic and this is coming from a guy who speaks into the mic you know absolutely it was phenomenal I've, i'm so excited i was just so excited for him i thought our conversation went great i hope you guys enjoy it so let's get after it Welcome, Nick the Astronaut, to the Back Pocket Podcast. How are you doing today, Nick? I'm all about them back pockets. Love it, dude. Hey, well, what, what's in your back pocket? What does the back pocket mean to you? Well, not my wallet anymore. Um, sciatic issues. I quit putting my wallet in my back pocket. It's bad for your posture, by the way. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And you, as you get old, man, you just feel it like up in your neck and stuff, and your right side is all tight. I gotta quit doing that. And uh, but when we talk about metaphorically, what's in my back pocket? Confidence. It would be confidence, and it's something that it happens through failure. And the quicker you can get there, because we all want to talk about our 10,000 hours and stuff like that. But really, your 10,000 hours with confidence begins at a young age, nature versus nurture. So when you're going into kindergarten, is your parent or parents slapping you on the back saying, you got this? Or is mommy saying, you'll be all right. Don't worry, you'll be all right. I'll be right here at 3.03 p.m. Don't worry, you'll be all right. No. I like being slapped on the backside in my back pocket saying I got this. And that's what I do with all my friends who are about to go on stage. I no longer ask them if they're ready. I say, you got this. There's a big difference in that wordage. Are you ready? You're asking a question. You're setting them up for fear. Because no matter what, if you've ever performed or spoke or anything like that, you know that there is a fear element there, but you have to blanket that. You have to hide that no matter what. It's within all of us, but we have to hide it. And when other people who are supporting you, they can instill in you not a question, but a statement. You got this. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I think um, our 10,000 hours in the game of confidence starts early on. And it's something that has led me to, um, to really kind of hit the ground running in the game of 
having the confidence to book these big wigs, to have the big dog conversations with people I have no business conversing with, we can all get there, you know, and it's, uh, I've faced that question a lot, not what's in my back pocket, but how'd you do it? Mother trucker, confidence, be confident. You either are or you're not. There is no in between. And it's something where we can do that when we talk with, to our bosses, to our superiors, to someone who runs a group, someone who runs a mastermind. They're going to think you should be running that mastermind if you roll in the first time confident when they give you your two minutes or one minute to stand up, introduce, introduce yourself, introduce your business. Do it with confidence. Do it like you might not even know what you're talking about, but do it like you know what you're talking about, like you're meant to be there. And then before you know it, you've got 14 people handing you business cards thinking that you can consult for them, that you can help them. And it's a weird place to be because it all stems from confidence. And so often, dude, I don't know what I'm talking about. I just know I lead this life and I just put one foot in front of the other, try to live in this moment as much as I can. And that's what's in my back pocket. Bam. That's love good. <laughs> that's about, good. I love, the, uh, I love the metaphor of life. Like you brought it right away. You said my mom. Yep. You know, what does your mom do? Is she right there for you after school? How about this? Like riding a bike, learning how to swim. Kissing a girl for the yep. first time, or a guy, 2018. Yep. Yep. All three of those things, if you just send it, if you just freaking do it, mm -hmm. that you, you go back in, you, you're not going to be afraid to jump in the pool for the yep. second time. You're not going to be afraid to pedal your bike yep. for the second time. Once you get that thing, man, you're, you're locked in. You have the confidence to do it again. Absolutely. And it's second nature to you. Mm -hmm. You fail at it the first time, mm -hmm. right? But that second time, that third time, becomes a habit. Yep. And... I think that it applies so much to life, man. You're, you're with Stationary Astronaut right now. You started, you created this empire out in Rochester, Minnesota. Hundred and what, 20,000 people in Rochester? Something like that. And a little background, I, I'm not from here. I'm from Denver. And when I found out the Gary V event that you put on was in Rochester, I did not know it was an hour and a half away until an hour and 20 minutes before the show started. <laughs> so I showed up a little late. But anyways, tell us a little about... Tell us a little bit about Stationary Astronaut. How did it all start? Where to go? Oh, man, it was something that it, the seed was planted early on, and it was planted before I had the name The Oxymoron Stationary Astronaut, because if you think about it, that's an absolute oxymoron, a stationary astronaut, when we think about an astronaut. So it all started, I'll be honest, man, uh, through fate. Um, I was locked up in 2010, Hennepin County Jail. Okay. That's kind of close to you, right? This is Hennepin County? Yeah, yeah. So I used to live off Franklin in Chicago. Okay. Okay. And I was locked up. And this dude, his name was Nick as well. He was going away for 20 years. Okay. But he had this like glow about him where he was meditating every single day. He had no time for the hoobla that goes down in the, the main hall, the mess hall. He's got no time. You know, he's always meditating, just focusing on himself. He knows he's going away for a long time. He brings me this book. It's called DMT, a spirit molecule. And at the time, I had no idea what the hell this was. Uh, it was 2010. So I might have been listening to Rogan's podcast for six months, if that. And this is before the documentary DMT, a spirit molecule. That all stemmed from this book. And then Joe Rogan obviously hosted the documentary. And so I read this book, and it was all talking about the glow of the jungle, the Amazon jungle, and how all these plants, these living things, have an auric field um, with the color of the rainbow. And we all have it, utilizing our chakra, chakra system. Some glow brighter than others. All depends how much work you do, and if you have a solid sleep schedule, if you eat sometimes organically, um, things like that. If you take care of yourself, you're going to glow a little further. But anyways, so I'm reading about this, and it was just crazy to me. I was like, what? There's this potent psychedelic, the most potent psychedelic ever runs through all of us. It's produced by our pineal gland, our lungs. It's in all these plants. And what, dude? Like, it's a gateway to the other side. And like, a little background, um, I lost my dad when I was six. And I held his hand while he died. But it's beyond that depressing shit. It's that he pointed into the corner of the room and he said, I see baby Nicole. I see baby Nicole. Baby Nicole was my cousin's twin that died at birth. 
And she was obviously, he was tripping out at this time. They took him off all life support. He was dying of cancer. And he kept saying, I see baby Nicole. I see baby Nicole. And um, sure enough, that was her coming through to grab him, pull him into the other side. And I'm a six-year-old hearing that. That's some adult stuff right there. That That's weird to me. So, But I always held on to that. Like, yo, there's something bigger working that we might not see, but we feel it. You know, and sometimes more than others. And if you ever work with some solid psychics, they talk about your lost loved ones will come talk to you in your dream. What's happening in your dream? Your the visuals in your dream and the emotions that you go through in those real, really real dreams. That's DMT flooding your brain. Um, and it's very cool when I read this book and it was explaining all this stuff. And then I was a felon at the time, a triple felon, and um, so I made it a point that I got out of jail and stuff like that, did all my stuff, and I realized, dude, I got to get down to the jungle. I have to get down there. So fast forward like five years, I get off felony probation, everything. 2015-ish? Um, yeah, 2015. So it was actually fall of 2014. So everything was um, dropped down to gross misdemeanor. So now I can leave the country. Okay, so after I got released um, from probation that day, I immediately went down to the first floor. I applied to get my, my um, passport. I got it like a month later. So my ball's rolling. This is December of 2014. January of 2015, I reach out to Aubrey Marcus, the owner of On It uh, oh, yeah. with Joe Rogan. And um, he was on Rogan's podcast. Uh, a few times. Yes. 900 region. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he was on his podcast talking about um, his trips down to the jungle. And I reach out to Aubrey. I tell him, listen, Aubrey, I failed Spanish all three times I took it. Like, I, I'm a gringo who can't speak a lick of Spanish. Tell me where I got to go. What retreat center do I have to go? Less than 24 hours later. I'm walking into my factory job at the time, and he hits me back. He's, he's like, what up, Nick? This is where you got to go. You got to talk to so-and-so and da 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 go to this website. So I did it. So my ball was rolling, okay? This was January 7th of 2015. The following month, so I got my passport. I know where I got to go. I don't have the money yet. I'm just working a nine to five, regular 9 to 5. Um, February 19th, I'm just kind of down in the dumps. Um, it's winter time. It's really dark, you know, and, uh, my wife and I, my girlfriend at the time, we go to this psychic. Her name is Jerema Silva. She's a Brazilian psychic, a very good family friend. Link me up with her. I go see her and she midway through the session, she just gets this feeling and I, she didn't know me from Adam. This is the first time she's ever met me. She just got this feeling, uh, Nick, you belong here. On this piece of paper where she was um, going through my chakric um, system, she writes Peru, circles it, stars it. She had no idea Aubrey Marcus told me where I got to go in Peru the month prior. So now my ball's really rolling. And I had felt in my heart, I got to quit this factory job. I'm moving up the totem pole, getting raises left and right, but getting certifications and stuff. But it just wasn't me. You know, I'm a salesperson. That's what I went to school for, working in business, grew up in small business. So I, uh, that, that like a month later, I quit that job. I moved back up here for a couple months to train in at this restoration sales gig. And sure enough, it just, the storm season rolls around. It starts going good for me. Money's falling out of the sky. I book my trip to Peru. So I go down there August of 2015. And throughout this entire process, man, the, the moguls you meet down there, oil tycoons, um, Silicon Valley tycoons, um, agents from New York, um, Florida, Miami, all these bigwigs go down here. James Cameron went to the same exact retreat I went to five years prior to making Avatar. So Just, this is an organized event that you attended? Yep, okay. yep, with with uh, with spiritual practitioners, um, shamans, and uh, a lot of them were American, mm -hmm. uh, a couple Australians. And it's just really a cool setting. Like, they actually wholeheartedly care about you, unlike therapists, where it's a transaction. You know, it's a monetary transaction where they know at the end of that session you're going to be cutting them a check. It's kind of a different story when you go down and work with these practitioners. So anyways, throughout the entire week, bro, you're drinking this strong brew. And I just kept thinking, like, man, I'm here, but I'm there. I'm on this side. But during ceremony, I'm on the other side. I'm tapped into something bigger. Kept thinking like what my dad saw when he was dying, stuff like that. And then sure enough, first night, my dad comes through with baby Nicole on his hand. You get my drift? And Jerema Silva told me and my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, that my dad was waiting there with two souls, two uh, children's souls 
waiting for us to have kids because they're going to reincarnate in, back into this third dimension. So we just had our first five months ago. We could attribute it to that. It might be baby Nicole. I don't know. But anyways, the following year, so I come back, I do my work, I start really focusing on the Wim Hof method, focusing on my breath. Love Wim Hof. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's book, magic. Becoming an Iceman. Yep. Yeah, he's good. He's really good, and mm. he's, he's tapped into something greater than himself. Absolutely. You, when you hear him talk, you absolutely know that. So I start doing the Wim Hof method, and I'm really focusing on like what I want to do when it comes to my purpose. Because like I told Gary, when I turn 30, I need to have my purpose honed in. So I plan another trip, and I call it Off the Grid August, where if it wasn't for um, Get Me Gary V this year, I would have been back down in Peru. Um, so I go back down again. I already knew we're already stationary astronauts. Something bigger is going on. But I come back with kind of the name of what I'm going to build my company around and what my purpose is going to be. I'm going to be a glue piece for movers and shakers, the Michael Jordans of what they do. And we're actually going to start making noise here in the Midwest. We're very lucky. We don't have all these forest fires. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have earthquakes, typhoons. We don't have um, uh, big tornadoes in our cities like Oklahoma City. We don't do. We're lucky. You know, um, a couple years ago, Hurricane Sandy had um, the base of the Statue of Liberty underwater. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to worry about that. We got 10,000 lakes that ain't going nowhere, you know? So we have a great place here when it comes to what the Mayo Clinic is doing, the number one hospital again on the planet. What happens when people get old? They need more health care. And as we are becoming so in tune with ourselves, now people's religion is their, that yoga mat. You know, that's their church on Sunday mm -hmm. is focusing within. Not this external higher power. They're realizing I, it's within me. I'm tapped. I am. I am a walking god. If I want to be, you know, with my mind, and if I focus on myself wholeheartedly, I can start. Life is malleable, and I can start taking risks. I can build my confidence up to the point an entity, an enigma, such as Gary Vaynerchuk, who none of us can touch. All of a sudden, I have the possibility to get him here through confidence, through connections, mm -hmm. through being a glue piece. Can you and, expand on that a little bit more? What do you mean by that? You're a glue piece. Um, so really, I am a connector. So my last um, my last retreat down in Peru, I always thought that my spirit animal, we all have a spirit animal, and it kind of guides us. It, um, it can really, the quicker you learn what your spirit animal is, and that's obviously just putting a label on it, but the quicker you, you learn what it is, it will really help guide your life and kind of your purpose in life. So I always thought like, oh, I'm a leader. It's a timber wolf, or I'm powerful. It's an African elephant. No, dude, it came... The other side came through and was like, motherfucker, you got it all twisted. Your spirit animal is a giant squid. And the reason for that is because those eight arms are very important. What you do is you grab people and you bring them in and you, you create teams. You grab them and you bring them in and you create teams. So I really took that and I ran with it. And um, that was in 2016. So I really started... I just want to mention this real quick. My spirit animal is the East Pacific Red Octopus <laughs> for the similar reason. I mean, Yo. those eight arms are able to vibe into the environment around them, and then that's how they become what they want to be, and they adapt to every environment. And that's like, all right, through this yes. podcast, I can talk to anyone and start vibing with that person. Get those tentacles, arms, that Red Octopus. So I, I feel that. That is dope, dude. Mm -hmm. That is so dope. Kindred spirits right here. Well, Yo, here's, here's my, my spirit animals, the Golden Eagle. Ooh. But like, I have no explanation for that at all. It was uh, it was bleed kind of red, just, white, and blue, dude. I, I bleed red, white, and blue. I feel like I uh, I try and be the most aware person. Like everything I do is so. I'm always trying to find another avenue. Like ever, we had this podcast guest who told us about sensory acuity. It's pretty much what Tony Robbins mm -hmm. preaches at times, and it was like all we, entrepreneurs have this way of always being aware of what's going on around mm. them. So when I'm I'm working at in a construction job right now, you know, I'm I'm learning the processes. I'm I'm waking up at 4 a.m., sometimes 3 a.m. coming to these pores. But what I'm really looking at is okay, how can I we have this superintendent who's mm. just a boss. He's been around for 40 years. But I look at how he has come in, in this last 2 to 3 months and how he's changed the goddamn culture of this job where it was unsafe, it was, you know, all these different things. And he comes in and he gets exactly what he wants, and that's what I pay attention mm -hmm. to. I try and mimic everything he does because I know 
that that's if I can apply that to the podcast, to our LLC, to you know everything in my life. I mean, it, it sounds selfish, like getting what you want, but if I'm in tune with myself, that I can understand, you know, that that's a greater good for other people. When you bring in people with your squid arms, you know, you bring in, uh, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk on one side, and then you bring Theo Vaughn in on the other side, which, by the way, I just try and sound like Theo Vaughn all the time, which is bad. You know, I don't want to sound like Theo Vaughn. At times, I mean, it's, it's good. pretty good. I don't know. He's Bro, a goof. gang gang, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, but you bring those guys in, right? And it's like, Theo Vaughn and Gary Vaynerchuk, like, wh- that makes no sense, right? But, dude, going to that performance in Rochester, that shit is awesome, dude. Like, I I was fueled up, man. And Andrew wasn't there because he was in Lollapalooza. But Andrew, like, we were talking about this last night. He was like, dude, you're, you, there's not a day in your life going forward where you won't talk about that night mm-hmm. or you won't talk about something re- revolving Gary Vaynerchuk. Like, you always talk about him. And it's like, dude, that's because it was powerful. That shit affected me. So thank you and, you know. It's that moment, out. man, that moment, and like so many people throughout that process, they weren't going to consume. They weren't going to go to it. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. Being in that room is what matters. And that's where you can go get the content that we've released all week. Gary has released all week. But it's just not the same, man. It's not the same about uh, like a Tony Robbins event. Man, you go to a Tony Robbins event, there's something about that big giant putting his arm around you squeezing you in that's going to change your life forever whether you catch that content on the back end or not just that moment but then again at uh at festivals staring up on hair yes up on arms just that physical touch yep. that emotion of that being that close makes a difference yeah. i've had that at festivals as well though mm-hmm. um gary and i i think we talked about uh my old dave matthews band days going down to um going down to alpine valley and when you're down there and you might be on some magic mushrooms i don't know wink wink and you just feel this connection with everyone in that in that venue. Oh my gosh, man! Nothing can take you take that away from you. You can listen to a million albums, but after um, an example I used actually on the podcast was when um, when uh, Super Freak died, you know, and they played it. They played Super Freak, bro. Rick James was was there with us, you know. It was just perfect timing. You had to be there. Yeah, you can hear their live series on an album that you buy from Best Buy. But, oh boy, man, something about being there, it changes the game. Or after Prince died. After Prince died, you wanted to be at every every show down at 1st Avenue or 7th Street Entry. You just had to be because you were going to catch a rendition of Purple Rain and it was going to change your life. The hairs were going to stand on your arms, you know? Mm -hmm. But that's the thing is... It's all about timing, you know, and I felt that the stars aligned for Gary V and Theo Vaughn, Giselle Ugardi, and DJ D-Mill, you know, the stars aligned, and even meeting the Social Works boys, the Social Butterflies, throughout this process, pulling them in with my arms, that's where magic happened, and Giselle will tell you, bro, we weren't the best prepared, you know, she was a, we were all chickens with our heads cut off, dog, and everything, like, she's the glue piece over there sitting on her freaking MacBook with her squirrel, she is the glue piece, dog, she pulled it in, everyone was so impressed with her, and if anyone is a born leader, it's that girl right over there, you know, and, um, shout out Giselle, because this doesn't happen without you, um, coming into the den, just off of Sarah Schuler, it doesn't happen without you, this is, this is thinking about people that's impacted us, and led to the next thing. Yeah. So Sarah connected us with you. You came on the show. Told us that you were going to be a host of Gary V. Then Declan has the opportunity to go see Gary V. And he gets to meet Stationary Astronaut. Bam, we're all connected. And this is something that's so unique. This collaboration right here, I mean, it's powerful. It's People can look at it as small. They'll listen to the podcast and they'll hear what our conversation took place. But the actual interaction between us five right now in this room, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's, a, that's a unique experience. Absolutely. The cameraman over there. I love you, dog. <laughs> Raph over there, man. He uh, rolled in in this. You should have seen what he was wearing, dude. Raph, what was that? Was that what kind of garb? Was that Hindu garb? What was that? It's it's called a prince coat, and it's a custom made coat, and it's for like fucking uh, weddings and shit, you know. <laughs> but I was like, I wanted to stand out, and I knew there would be people in suits, but so I was like, screw it, I'll wear a wedding garb. <laughs> like Gary Vee it's formal 
Dude. Yeah, Gary Vee will remember the one person who's wearing something weird. You know, yeah. everybody else is wearing good clothes. And, mm-hmm. You know, but like that's nice. that's like confidence like, in yourself yeah. to just do that because you know, like Gary Vee literally talked about it at the at the show, and he was like. You guys are so worried about like living like you're in third grade still where mm-hmm. you're like worried about what everyone else is thinking. Yep. Like that's a great example of like, you know what, I'm going to put my ass on the line mm-hmm. and, you know, really stick out and just see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Think about it, though. Like say you go to a comedy show, right? The comedians you love. Ooh, Mr. Butterfly's giving us a jingle. The comedians we love the most are the ones that we know are confident up on stage. Same thing with any performer. Mm -hmm. You can tell when it's uncomfortable for them up there. And it's like, oh, that's why I'm in a hole-in-the-wall venue and you don't belong up there. But the ones I'm drawn to and kind of like those leaders in third grade, the ones who are confident. And that was just me, man. And I don't know if it was growing up as an athlete. I still hold all the shooting records at my old high school for basketball and I had to be confident, and they say the best shooters are the – they have a uh, short memory span. So I would get taken out if I wouldn't shoot. So I got to forget about the eight shots I just missed, and I got to keep popping. And that's something where it was just my life. So when all my friends were scared to take their training wheels off, I was just doing it. When all my friends were scared to ollie this eight stare, I was just doing it. Um, think about the consequences later. I always talk about – I love the people who just say yes and worry about their calendar tomorrow. Those are the kind of people I love. The kind of people like uh, Giselle over here or Mr. Butterfly. We're all going to New York in a couple months uh, for the Jets-Vikings games. game. All of us were like, yep, we're going, and we'll worry about our calendar tomorrow. We'll worry about getting off work tomorrow. We'll worry about that later. Let's live in the moment, and let's, let's focus on the good times. Because once you make that commitment, you will figure out a way to make it happen. You're but you first right. have to make that commitment. You can't be one foot in. Mm-hmm. Because then the whole time you're like, eh, I don't know if this is going to work. I can't. I, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing with my time during this uh, Jets-Vikings game in New York. I mean, that's a, quite the leap. But make that commitment. Make that verbal altercation with each other. And then, boom, you'll make it happen. What do you get out of people who don't travel? You always get closed-mindedness. You get people who, um, the, a lot of them, uh, mo- all racist people don't travel. You get my drift? And they're the no people. I like yes people. People who just, they worry about their calendar tomorrow. And what you get out of that, it's beyond the travel. It's beyond the beautiful sights and the cool Instagram pictures you're going to get. It's all about the moment. You're going to get the moments out of it. You're going to meet this random old dude at a coffee shop you wouldn't have been at. You wouldn't have met if you didn't say yes two months prior. You know, and you get put in these weird situations where, for me, being down in Aikido's, where it smells like shit everywhere, but you're just forced, like, there's armed guards all over the place, but you're just cruising, man. It doesn't matter. Uh, Funny story, my last time I was down there, we were in the market after we got out of the jungle the day before. We were in the market day before we um, flied out as well, and uh, I had one of my my friends down there gave me a... um, gave me a, a um uh, what's it called where uh it's you can you can read it uh with other languages in it um spanish in it it's a uh, translator translator book mm-hmm. and i had it in my pocket and i had my wallet in my other side in uh cargo shorts and then the translation book in my left side and a spanish person in the in the in the streets down there stole my translation book so they figured out how to speak their own language Good for them. Yeah, Yeah. They doinked me. But the thing is, I'll never forget that. And it put me in a position where it's like, okay, I got to mind my P's and Q's when I come back here. Things like that. Um, Denver, Colorado. I'll be in Denver and Breckenridge a month from today uh, for a wedding. And it's something like the last time I was there, I drove through South Dakota, drove back Nebraska. I took an interstate or a county road, my bad. I took a county road on the way back. What happened? We got pulled over. I know not to take county roads in Nebraska anymore. Yo, Raph is tripping over there. You good, bro? Dude, I... Oh! I your yo! Face to be a are we being abducted right now? <laughs> Stationary oh. astronaut style. <laughs> Holy moly, baby. Um, We cannot forget that this podcast is sponsored by Justin Lagash at Sun Butter. Make sure you tune in. Go online. Check it out. They've got so many options, baby. Allegedly, but still at the same time sponsored. Allegedly. Allegedly. We love being allegedly yeah. sponsored. You better cut some checks. Though. Skyline yeah. specs and be outdoors. Hey, let's take let's take note real quick. We got gear on. 
We got the stationary astronaut gear on. You guys got the uh, rebranded logo because it had to shrink down with the Gary V event. That's something that we realized is just effective in any manner. Absolutely. I mean, you, you can't be um, over-promoting something that's – or promoting anything in regards that can't be detailed, fine-tuned. Um, so you guys had to re-logo. This was, this was in the past five weeks? Um, probably the last three months. Three months. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Right on. We, did, we just did the same thing because we had so much words and just it was kind of a, just a lot of bojangles, bojangling around in there in mm-hmm. our logo. And uh, we, we kind of just sat down one day and we are like, look, we can just simplify this and keep the same thing, but just make it stand for something more. Mm-hmm. You know, like when I, uh, a good example would be uh, Beats, like Dr. Dre, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Dre. Um, he, his logo is the B and it says Eats, you know, Beats, but everyone recognizes the B. Mm-hmm. We're back pocket, but we want everyone to recognize the B. The front. The front, it, it, which is just the B and it has a P built into it. It's Good just call. Sim- it's just mm-hmm. a simple logo that we can promote, put on all kinds of stuff. You can see it from far away. You know, your dad with bad eyes can recognize that that's the back pocket. You know, all those kind of things, all, all kind of are, uh, it's more symbolic, I mm-hmm. guess. Uh, one thing I want to touch on real quick about travel. So Andrew went to Hawaii this past J term, so January, and I've been to London, Ireland, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Sick uh, brag. Yeah, sick brag, dude. Anyways, but I think uh, one thing that you were touching on or just getting to was perspective. Mm-hmm. When you go anywhere outside your social circle, anywhere outside your bubble where you're forced to be uncomfortable, you know, like Giselle said in one of our previous podcasts, like one of her, one of her things is, you know, she's comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. She's, she's very much herself when she's outside of, you know, that zone. So I think that's one thing about when you go on like a vacation or you go travel for that Vikings Jets game, like you are fully immersed in that moment and you, it's fight or flight at every decision you make. And it makes you who you are and it totally under, like helps you understand the world, I think. That's the best um, being comfortable, uncomfortable. That is something where it's never kind of talking about our friends who are about to take stages. It's the most uncomfortable thing ever, but you get to the point where you sharpen your sword and it's, it's just like second nature now. Same thing with travel, hopping on a train, not being able to read the signs, but you know, okay, I need to go in this direction. And you get there and before you know it, oh, I'm glad I took that leap because I met this person or I got put in this situation that tested me and I grew from it. You see that with big cities as well. Um, being in uh, the rat race, bro, in New York City or um, I'm not going to say Miami. Miami is a... Have you ever been to Miami? I have not, but you could say like Chicago, LA. Chicago as well. There you go. Um, LA for sure. Miami is a different kind of city. It's kind of just South Beach and downtown. And I'll never forget when I was down there last fall um for work (laughs) i saw the same drug dealer later in the night that was trying to offer us drugs downtown he was down in south beach where we were staying and then the next day we were back downtown went to a museum and sure enough he was back there and it's so easy for them to get back and forth no matter drug dealer or not it's just very the commute is easy chicago is a little different um same thing with new york city um new york city's a zoo same thing with la just a freaking zoo Now when I go to California, we go every February. We go kind of uh, mid-state. We go stay in Santa Cruz, um, stay up in the hills there, go up to San Francisco, um, hit up some redwoods. Go, um, man, it's just like experiencing. Um, Nowadays, because I'm an old man with a child, I like... by the way. Thank you, thank you, brother. I like to experience the things that, like, young whippersnappers, they're just not comfortable with, you know, um... The clubbing in big cities is played out for me. Things like that, going uh, bar hopping. Um, I always hit up a museum and I hit up some visual stuff. Um, so when I, I drive through South Dakota to get to Colorado every time because I love the Black Hills. I just love it. It's might sound corny, but I love it. It's God God's country. And same thing with like I was just in Toronto. Bro, I make sure to hit up a museum. I'm by myself for work, but I make sure to hit up a museum might seem corny but the thing is is man it's just like it's the experience and then i make make something fun out of it like when i travel i do this thing called where's dave he's one of my old partners um he's 
got a deep radio voice, worked in radio for a long time, and uh, bigger boy, and he's got a big burly beard. So what I do is I take his head off and I throw it on stuff. So when I'm in a museum, I'll throw it on a monkey. Oh, where's Dave? Found him. Or I'll do it on like old Greek statues, you know, the heads. I go in, there's Dave's head on every single one of them. Just little things like that where I'm getting my rocks off by myself. And that's the cool thing why I like Snapchat um, that I'm about to graduate um, from. Why I like Instagram because... We can be creating our own moment by ourselves, and we feel like we're not alone. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I love technology. Yeah, Yeah. I I love it too. I was just explaining to like I love. I also work with just a bunch of old guys. Yeah. And they're you know the old man complaint is always like, oh, everyone's always on their phone, like like video games, you know, blah blah blah, just not really know what they're talking about. I was like, do you guys understand how much I accomplish with this phone in addition to the stuff I do for work? Like I'm connecting with people on linkedin instagram sometimes facebook every almost every second of the day i'm posting stories i'm just that interaction i'm actually leveraging you know the my phone for its capabilities Mm -hmm. for good and for you know something that i actually care about and i think that's a big uh, misnomer it's a big misnomer where everyone's always assuming like they're on their phone playing like Pokemon. Like, granted, Andrew, you do play a lot of Pokemon on your phone, but like gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them all. Exactly. That no excuses. <laughs> so, you know, I I think it's a it's an interesting stigma, but man, you can really leverage and make shit happen from your phone. See, the thing is, is it's a perception thing where old heads think it's um, which it used to be all about attention. Now we're seeing timelines are being based on value. And that's something where back in the day, back in the 90s, your value to your neighborhood was, oh, you have a trailer so you can go help Josephine and Larry move down the street. That's your value for the day. Now you can provide value throughout the day using the Internet with your smartphone. That's powerful right there. Um, I like when we talk about being a glue piece, being that squid, being that octopus where I can provide value for my connections, for my teammates all day long. Nick, I need this. Oh, I got you. I know the guy. Just yesterday, Raf and Brandon needed to meet because Raf is a beast on After Effects. You know what I'm saying? Things like that where it used to, you used to have to send a pigeon to be of value. Now, it's just one group message away. What did we do this morning? You added Andrew into our group message. Boom, you provide a value. No matter what, just like that. And then we start talking. We're going to give haircuts tonight. That's going to be a fun time. Things like that. So, man, did we ask an average quality? I forget. We have not. No. Okay, so that leads us perfectly into our first question of this interview. Which is usually what we start as, but you know what? When we got guests on like this, when, when we the, get rolling, we gotta get rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. This train does not stop. No. So the back pocket, it's your wildly average podcast. Mm-hmm. It's always been your wildly average podcast. And your, we get your co-host, a couple average guys, mm-hmm. love recognizing where we need to improve. Mm-hmm. You started with talking about confidence yep. through failure. Yep. Boy, we lived the failure, and we continue to live failure, and that's what we try to ride our horse on Mm -hmm. is finding that failure and pushing forward and finding you say um you got this we say figure it out Mm -hmm. same methodology um and it all comes through the average quality that self-recognition through humility of being like okay i'm not that great Mm -hmm. you're connecting people to improve on those qualities or you try to improve it yourself Mm -hmm. so nick what is your average quality i tell you what man I would say one of my best qualities would be my confidence. So then my average quality, and this is going to kind of come from left field, it would be my anxiousness, my anxiety. And it's something where I'm always working on it. And it's forcing me to humble a freaking braggadocious dude. You know, Um, I always accept that it's in my back pocket. I accept that it's there. I accept that it's with me when I wake up at five o'clock in the morning. And I know I didn't do enough the day before I got more to do today. Um, the thing is, is anxiousness and anxiety gets a bad rap. It's something that we all have in some shape or form, some more than others, some acknowledge it and some don't. The reason I say it's in my back pocket and it is my average quality is because I can put it at bay. That's where confidence comes from. You're able to tell to fuck off for a little while, but it's still there and I accept it. Some people deny that and then they end up in problematic situations because they won't accept it um and then they have anxiety attacks they uh you see people who 
They um, people who have never been forced to. Um, they've never been put in weird situations in life. They might have been a trust fund baby. They might have had everything handed to them in life. A perfect American made household, two parent household where they never had to face real issues in life. Maybe in ninth grade with this or that. Um, they just lived the on the surface the perfect lifestyle. I feel bad for those type because eventually they're going to have to face the music. Uh, I have um, a buddy down in Rochester who grew up in a builder household where his family is a big wig builder, built, did a lot of big projects, and he had school paid for, for him. He was allowed to be a super duper senior, never had to really face the wrath of life, was allowed to drink too much, stuff like that. Mid-20s, he has to face the music when the traveling's over, reality is setting in, where it's like, no, dude, Everyone's making moves, but you're just still, you might have a master's degree. You might be gunning for that doctorate, but what's it going to do? Yeah, it'll look cool on the wall, but bro, we're all putting our hours in. You know what I'm saying? That's a different kind of anxiety that he was yet to accept. It's obviously just a comparison I'm making, but I've always been open. Like you see me do these mental health Mondays where... Bro, I love talking about mental health. I love talking about where we're at because some of my favorite people are the most anxious ones and they're the ones that accept it. So I know that might not be what you're looking for, but anxiousness and anxiety is probably my go-to when it comes to accepting it, realizing I have it, and then pushing forward. That hit, that's it. That hits home. And I thank you for saying that. Yeah. And I know definitely a lot of our marketing interns will yeah. relate to that yeah. because anxiety no matter how impactful it is like you said there's different levels every person handles every person has different anxiety levels it's that's science i mean that's inside us those are those chemicals reacting in different ways um me i i fail to recognize my anxiety on multiple occasions i've had a handful of mental breakdowns whether it was pressure too much pressure on a football field and small scales like that or trying to figure out what i'm supposed to do with my life Mm -hmm. i'm 22 years old and i don't put that in perspective and i try to put all that pressure on me and then it turns into stress and anxiety rises and i'm panicking Mm -hmm. and when you mention stuff like that you got to just embrace it you have to recognize it and appreciate it because it can make you more powerful once you feel it and another great example is when you're just traveling um There's so many minor little minute things that you go through during traveling where your anxiety builds, like whether it's the the plane being delayed and then your anxiety rises because like I'm not going to meet my parents at this time and all everything's going to be thrown off. And those are like real world problems that don't that could be translated in a fine tuned fashion where you're just like, okay, good. That happened. Good. How can I utilize the time that's presented and then move forward? Um, Anxiety is so important to understand because it is in all of us and every single person will handle it differently and that answer right there thank you dude that was did an anxiety hit when you got a notification on your phone saying there's a missile coming for hawaii yes when i was in hawaii that was a perfect another example i'm in there uh it was i think it was like january 19th and uh on my phone it just alerts me saying uh nuclear missile heading towards hawaii that's right And I'm sitting in my hotel room in Honolulu, the most populated portion of Hawaii. You know they're hitting Honolulu versus... If you're on any island, you're going to get smoked. But Honolulu is going to be ground zero. And I'm like, okay. Um, Laying in my bed a little hungover from the night before because it's 9 in the morning. And uh, I'm talking to my girlfriend on the phone. And I was like, hey, do you mind Googling uh, if there's a nuclear missile coming towards Hawaii? I just got a notification. She goes, what? Yeah, just, just Google it for me. And she Googles it. And while she's Googling it, I go out to the hallway. And I'm like, all right, there's got to be commotion going on. Let's see what what everyone else is doing because I have no idea what to do. All my roommates in my hotel room had gone to breakfast early, so I'm by myself. Open the door. Maid's sitting there. You want towels? I go, no. I don't know. Close the door. Like, Like, what? You want towels? There's a nuclear missile coming my way. And... I go back into my room. Girlfriend says, well, you got 15 minutes if, it is, if this is actually happening. Once, if, uh, if it was North Korea, whatever, Russia, whatever it was, if they sent it, you have 15 minutes. I was like, I did not pro- I talk about not processing it. I was like, this can't be real. For the next 15 minutes, I was just like, all right, let's stay on the line and let's hopefully everything like 
doesn't happen. I turn on the news. People are jumping into manholes, jumping into the pool in the back of like hotels or in their yard because supposedly the radiation won't hit as hard. Manholes. And some people are just sitting on the curb with 40 in their hand, just drinking. It's like, talk about chaos. It was utter chaos. The university, which was two miles north, um, just people trampeding over each other to get to the uh, nuclear missile like um, base that like you can stay protected, and it wasn't like big enough, so people weren't getting allowed in. Talk about like uh, P- PTSD from that. Like you're not getting allowed into the place that's the most safe, and you're standing on the outside as a student, 20 years old. Like, what am I supposed to do now? It ended up not happening. Like we got a notification 39 minutes later. Oh. And it was like, uh, sorry, this was a false alarm. That was a long 39 minutes. Long 39 <laughs> minutes. Another thing um, is accepting. Good, that's a crazy story. Sorry. We've bro. never, we've that's actually crazy. never told that on the podcast. That's so a I'm crazy glad. story. Yeah. It's, it was nuts, but it was once. I, I love telling it yeah. because yeah. At, at the end of the day, it wasn't, it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. So I could take a deep breath and try to realize during that moment, what could I have done differently? I got to call my parents. It's crazy how um, when circumstances like that, kind of like with sports, everything slows down Mm -hmm. where that 39 minutes feels like three hours and, or it might've gone quickly. I don't know. But for me, man, things like that, Oh, stressful situations where you're no longer in control. That's where you have to just ultimately let go. And that's where love comes from. Unconditional love. When you have to fully let go, situations where it's totally out of your control a lot of a lot of um a lot of it comes from you know us being at shows and things like that where you're just so in the moment you just love everyone i learned another thing that i put in my back pocket would be my add um a shaman down in peru malcolm rossiter he's uh he's an australian shaman he i was asking him Man, I cannot stay focused. And that was actually going to be my main uh, back pocket when I was reading through the pre-questions was my focus. Because I am the best at focusing. I can hone in, but I'm also the worst. And I'll admit it. And my ADD just gets the best of me, dog. I've been diagnosed. um, But the thing is, is I think that in a nutshell is a crutch um, for some people. Some others, you just know they got it. But if you're someone who can function and get stuff done, Chances are good it's just a crutch because we all have some form of attention deficit disorder, whether we want to admit it or not, especially with these smartphones we deal with on a daily basis. We wake up to them. We go to sleep with them. Um, we're, we're cell phone whores, you know, we're technology whores. But anyways, um, he told me, he's like, Nick, send your, your babbler, they call it, send your babbler on a mission. Every single time he wants to start chirping when you have to get stuff done, send him on a mission and tell him not to come back until... He comes back with the answer. So since 2016, I've been doing that. And I've been using it to my advantage where I send them on a mission where little angles. Because, you know, uh, when you're navigating in life and you want to provide provide quality to um, our life and to other people's life, you've got a lot of missions, especially in the 21st century with everything moving so fast. Bro, we're expected to get a million things done in a day. So when you have ADD, it's very tough. So what I do is I send that mother trucker on a mission every single morning and don't come back until you got an answer for me. And it works. And it might be a placebo, but it works. It actually works. And it's tangible because I get shit done. It's something that it's a tool I use. I I tell people, you know, um, if you if you want to get a leg up and you have these issues where you can't focus or whatever that may be, you have a lot on your plate and you have minimal time to get stuff done. Start utilizing that. Send it on a mission, and we can call it our, we can call it our uh, ego or whatever we want to do. But at the same time, bro, we can use it to our advantage. And I think we all, like college students, for instance, man, if college students could really sharpen that sword, and instead of t- relying on their Adderall, they could send their babbler out, and they could just stay in the pocket, stay in the pocket. And then send your babbler out. And then when it comes to uh, maybe a um, an, uh, part of a, uh, um, a math test you have coming up, you're not really good at this part where you send him out and he'll come back. And two days before when you're really crunching for your test, he comes back with an answer. Now, that's obviously trippy to think about, but it works, man. And it's something where it's like setting intention is huge. Tony Robbins talks about it. Setting intention is probably one of the most important things we can do for our life. And I think that's what I'm getting at when it 
when it, when I talk about sending your blabber out to go get a mission done, it's really setting intention. Don't come back until you come back with the answer. I don't want to talk about it. I'm too busy. I got to stay in the pocket. And that's something where I really, as I, as I get older, man, I, with a daughter and stuff and being married, I really have to focus on that because let's be honest, man, as you age and you guys will realize this, your time and your energy is so fucking important. Um, nowadays, we want to be yes men and we want to say yes to everything, but we've really got to be calculated about it when it comes to saying yes to everything. Um, now I see why Gary V and Zach Nadler, his, uh, his booking agent, uh, Gary doesn't know about anything until a couple weeks out. You know, it's Zach Nadler who has to say yes to the right opportunities. And with me, I throw the name Mayo Clinic out a lot and the DMC out a lot. And sometimes it gets me in trouble. But at the same time, that's my ace in my sleeve, the Mayo Clinic. I couldn't get Gary Vaynerchuk up here to the Twin Cities. It just wasn't that kind of draw, you know. You need to provide these people with unique opportunities when booking. That's the most important thing. Theo Vaughn, I took Theo Vaughn because I couldn't get Joe Rogan, I'll be honest. Um, yeah, so I was talking with Joe Rogan's booking agent. He works with one here in Minnesota. And it's been the same one for years. And I couldn't... They gave me a deadline where I had to... After he filmed his latest Netflix special, I had to wait exactly three months. But that was pushing it. That was late July. So there was just no way we were going to get him. And he costs a lot. And he double books, so... He, if we did it, we'd have to do two Friday shows, two Saturday shows. That's just how he does it. Makes him a lot of money. So I went with Theo Vaughn and Theo Vaughn was, um, he fired his manager halfway through the process. I had already paid down payment on him. He fired his manager. They weren't doing much for him or whatever. So everything that could have went wrong throughout this process did go wrong times a million. And then that comes into uh, what comes into play there is just this blind faith that everything's going to work out. You got this. I got this. I got this. Pat on the butt. I got this. We like to say, uh, good. Have you have good. you seen that Jacko pot? Jacko, baby. Mm -hmm. Something goes wrong. Something goes bad. You know, something goes, doesn't go your way. Re good. Calibrate. Good. Yeah. Reengage. Reengage. And he's using this exact like mic, and I'm yeah. looking at you yeah. from this angle. I'm like, holy shit, this is Jacko just. Talking in the mic, dude. Well, we, I might be bringing him out here in February. Um, but the thing is, bro, is like, I feel so bad because he doesn't have the draw here. And it's very tough to, that's a big gamble. We just gambled hard with Gary. Took a loss, but um, it was a great clout builder. But with these, man, these public speakers, they cost a lot of money. Um, and the cool thing is now that we got Gary in our back pocket and he's endorsed us to like Tim Ferriss and stuff. We can get these people. But at the same time, I can't bank on the public perception. That's the toughest part, man, with um, with even musicians nowadays. People are making excuses to not go to shows. Like, um, my wife and I are going to Lil Dicky at the Armory here in a couple months. You're kidding. Yeah, it's going to be the shit. Are you coming? I'm coming. Are you going to be there? No, but now I want to. I get, didn't know he was coming here. Get your shit together. Yeah. When is it? When is it? October, first week of October. Oh. I think it's October 4th, maybe. That would be fun. Let's go. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're going, baby. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a good time. Lil Dicky at the Armory. That's going to be a good time. Um, but Lil Dicky and like his booking process, they're so smart with how they do it where they build hype, they build hype, and they create a lot of content, and then he goes on tour. With speakers, they're just on tour. Their tour never stops. If they get the right opportunity for a Mayo Clinic or whatever that may be, they'll hop on it and they'll go. And that's very tough because in Minnesota, we are enslaved to the Four Seasons. So we have to base so much. Uh, we, can't, we can't risk bringing Joe Rogan here in February when Lord knows we're going to get a blizzard sometime. Mm -hmm. That could ruin everything. And we can't bank on that. We don't have sunny Southern California weather. And it's totally out of your control. All the way. All the way, man. Just kind of like doing a um, uh, doing a concert or a festival outside. Dude, you're risking everything on one weekend and the weather being all right. Mm -hmm. It's tough, man. It's a big gamble um, when you don't have the deepest pockets. So that's kind of uh, where we're trying to, like even Jay Shetty. So we might be bringing Jay Shetty out here. And I'm waiting because his Facebook watch um, show is on fleek. 
mm-hmm. 25 million views every single video within the first week, you know, killing it. Um, but it's just very tough when you're dealing with Midwestern minds. We don't have the New York state of mind. We don't have um, people who are ahead of the curve in Los Angeles. We have this weird mind state here where everything trickles in, in. you know, everything trickles from the coast from the coast yeah whether yes. it's the vibes of cali or the uh-huh. vibes of new york yeah. that hard or that chill yeah. it's all feeling those trends and that's kind of what i'm curious about so how do you try to recognize those trends in the midwest do you wait until they're full blown and they've already hit so then the midwest realizes it and then you go after it instead of trying to find that new piece of information or is it kind of all flowing together nope i have to be ahead of the curve because it's a doggy dog world out there and that's why i knew i had to sign the dotted line for gary vanderchuk before someone else did same thing with Jay Shetty. Same thing with Jago Willink. Um, I'm trying to be ahead of the curve. I call it the Joe effect. If they've been on Joe Rogan, I want them here. Oh, yeah. That's the long and the short of it. Kind of like Oprah. Everything Oprah endorsed in the 90s and early 2000s, it turned to gold. The O effect. It, it was just tangible. It would happen. Same thing with Joe Rogan. You go on his podcast, that means you're a, you're a dog. You're, you're a mover and a shaker. And you have something going for you. And so that's where... We're trying to kind of tap into that vein, and we're trying to play that trickle-down effect um, with anyone who goes on Joe Rogan. I do my research, even like Graham Hancock. So Graham Hancock, I knew about him way before he was going on Joe Rogan just because of the work he was doing in, um, with the pyramids and stuff. And um, then he started going on Joe Rogan, and then I went and met him at the U of M, saw him speak, and then um, met him before, and then uh, chopped it up with him afterwards. And it was really cool because... This is a guy who was just on Rogan, Rogan's podcast a month prior, and um, I'm sitting there chopping it up with him. And then Dennis McKenna recently, um, where I met Dennis McKenna that night at Graham Hancock. No one even knew who Dennis McKenna was. And then um, I went and met Dennis uh, again uh, a couple months ago. He was doing a speaking engagement um, in St. Paul. And I went up to him just confident and i told him that story about how i was the only one who recognized him that night at graham hancock and i was telling him about mayo clinic and how i've got some ins there we would like to start doing some ayahuasca research but we would have to bring residents from the mayo clinic that's typically what they do with their studies they'll send residents down because they have a medical mind they're on the verge of becoming a doctor and they'll give some actual um solid results um, so I was telling him about this and how we could make it happen. And then I gave him my card, my stationary astronaut business card. And he's like, yo, your business card is way cooler than mine. Here, take mine. So since then, we've been working with him. We're going to be, uh, I'm actually, we're going to be bringing him down to Rochester with uh, Gabor Mate next year. That'll be cool. We'll do that as a salon installment. Um, if we get Neil deGrasse Tyson, it will be after Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, so we're just going to be doing, we're having the conversations that need to be had kind of like what you guys are doing with your podcast, man. We want to keep it consistent, but I want to tap into a vein that hasn't been tapped in yet into yet. I don't want to do this, this blast stuff, the stuff that we don't, we won't have guaranteed results. Nowadays, I only want to hit home runs. I'm I'm not getting any younger. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste Giselle's time. I don't want to waste D Mill's time. I don't want to waste our Netflix comedian's time. We only want sure things. So when people are attending our events, we want to make sure that they're going to leave with something. And that's the cool thing with Netflix comedians and um, world-renowned public speakers. You have to be there to get the goods. You can't um, download the Kendrick Lamar album before you go to the XL Energy Center to see him and you already heard the goods of what he's going to be providing. That's not the case. So many people with Gary Vaynerchuk, they talk, oh, I can already, I can just get it on YouTube. No, you can't. Same thing with Netflix comedy. Bro, if they're an actual comedian, one, they're not putting it up on YouTube after every single one of their sets. And two, you got to go there live, dog. You got to mm-hmm. go see it. And that's where you get the gut busters. Yeah, I went and saw Rogan live yeah. last year, June, uh, here in Minneapolis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I needed that. I had been a fond, like, you talk about listening to his podcast. I think I was. Like junior, senior year in high school, I started a little bit, and then it really hit home in college when I had more free time and whatnot. But I got finally got an opportunity to see him live. I jumped on it. June twenty second, I was there. That was my bachelor party. <laughs> yes, yep. yes. <laughs> I went to the. Uh, it was the Friday second. It was the second show on a Friday. Um, phenomenal, and I, now I'm like that turned me into like the ultimate Joe Rogan guy. And I was like, talk about seeing someone in person and truly feeling it. He's one of those examples, and it was. Truly remarkable. What what blows my mind, and this really didn't uh, 
it didn't really hit me big. So we got Dave Meltzer on our podcast uh, about a month ago. Shout out to Dave. Dave, yo, he thinks uh, we have this uh, theory we talked about on the last podcast. Our, our roommate thinks that Dave just thinks we're a bunch of dweebs, which is fine. You know, whatever. If you got to go back to listen to that podcast to really understand why. Dave might be right. He might be. He, he probably <laughs> is. But what I what we realized, so Dave had this party. He was supposed to have this 50 for 50 party in Minneapolis a couple weeks ago. Or last week, flight got canceled, wasn't able to make it, mm-hmm. whatever. What we realized is when we showed up and like with all the other people that were supposed to be there, we're like, we are such a small kernel of the people that he taps into on such a large scale. Gary V, in my opinion, is the same thing. Millions of followers. And then he talks about the 98% of the people that don't that will listen to his stuff but not do it. I say we're the 2%, mm-hmm. right? And then you boil that down to, okay, who has the opportunity of those 2% to get in front of his face, to book him, mm-hmm. to have that conversation, you know, that Q&A, right? Mm-hmm. He talks about like two people. Two people of the two percent, you know, it, at the end of the day, it boils down to this small, minute little kernel mm-hmm. of people. And when we were at this Dave Meltzer thing, it got canceled. Whatever, he's coming back. But again, it's that kernel of people, and it's like, man, we are in such. We worked this way all the way to get to this point. Now we're here. We fought the uphill battle. It's time to take advantage of the opportunity. And it's not like you got to over prepare. You got to have your pitch ready, your elevator pitch. It's like, no, dude, you already did that. The last year and a half, the back pocket has built itself Mm -hmm. into this mantra that Andrew and I didn't ever write on paper until yesterday. We didn't have a business plan until yesterday, (laughs) right? But like, <clears throat> that whole mantra, that whole, you know, back to my thing is like the whole idea that you, you just got to get to that opportunity mm-hmm. and your work is going to take advantage of that. And and Dave is going to love us. He he understands we're dweebs and we met for 45 minutes, but we've had an impact on him ever since then. And now we're ready to take to the next step. Same thing with Gary V. Like you're just getting, you're just trickling your foot in the door mm-hmm. at each of these places, but you're staying in the lane. So you know, Gary knows about you. He promoted you. Did you a favor? You guys are having a, you guys are you know having your you're in your uh, uh, honeymoon moment right now. But you know what? I guarantee you, in a year from now, there's gonna be something bigger at that point, right? Or there's gonna be a, more of a genuine interaction. So you just gotta have to, you have to find all these different avenues, which is exactly what you're doing. And you're just gonna build this family, dude. That's what we're doing. We're we're turning that kernel on its side, and we're uh, it's actually, a seed. You're, we're, you're planting yeah, we're the making seed. a bag of popcorn now. No, but like I uh, I like what you said about that two percent because I see it in the podcast world. Everybody wants to start a podcast. Everybody thinks their voice is so important that their opinion matters. Okay, make your opinion matter. Go start a podcast. Get your equipment. Get your get your lips in account rolling or whatever that may be. Go uh, qualify for Spotify and iTunes. Go do it. Ninety-eight percent, shoot, ninety-nine point five percent ain't gonna do it. And no and one's then, gonna do a podcast for more than seven episodes. Exactly, long. and then you might do seven, and then are you gonna keep doing it? Because in the podcast world, consistency is key. Mm-hmm. And um, then you break that number down even more. So, man, like I am, uh, I have been tainted very hard since eighteen months ago when I started my show. I've been tainted because I've seen so many come and so many go. I've seen. Way too many talkers and not enough doers. And when you're talking on this microphone, you better be doing too. And that's those are the people I love. The ones who wake up and they're a voice on Go 96.3. And they actually do as well, where they show up to meetings. They're accountable. Accountability is key. Um, there are people who have bailed on uh, where I dedicate in a blizzard a Sunday morning episode where I typically don't record on Sundays. That's my, that's my holy day. And I, I open up the shop and I open up the office and we're going to cut an episode and you don't show up. And you hit me up on Instagram Messenger two hours after we were supposed to record and you made your bed, dog. It's over. So I wish you the best, but you'll never get another opportunity with me. Why is that? Not that I don't give second chances. I'm too busy, man. Good luck getting that second chance. Mm. I keep it moving. And that's the podcast world, bro, where we are the new radio. That's just what it is. These long-form conversations, people eat them up because we're commuting more than ever. I love it. It's a beautiful thing, having these conversations. And the ability to have the conversations is huge for that person 
um, involved in the conversation, and then you get a chance to record it and share it to an audience. I mean, that's cool. You like the people that you've had on your show, the people that we've had on our show, any show in that manner, and then you have the ability to anyone has access to that forever. That's cool. Should we just start speaking things into fruition? How about the Nick and Giselle show? What do you guys think about that? I think it's got. Yeah, I think it's got. Yeah, I think it's got to happen, Doc. It's a it's a birdie putt that sinks. Yep. You know, it, it, the the ball get legs. It, it goes in. I think it's got to happen. Mm-hmm. Cultivating heat for sure. Oh, when, yeah. are, when are we gonna feed this dog some nut butter? I mean, sun butter. <laughs> in, in a very sh- in a very <laughs> soon time. Dude, that slipped. Up. Nick and Squirrel show. <laughs> The Nick and Squirrel Show, baby. <laughs> Nick and Squirrel. Well, we're transitioning to the last few portions of okay. our show. This portion is a game. So oh, game Jesus. alert. This is something we didn't prep you with. Something that we didn't prep this time along. Oh, boy. But we're just going to hit it home. The game format. So game. 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 game, game. Dang, dang. The game format is I give you a word. You give me a word. Simple. What's the catch? It's just the first thing that comes in your head. So we're going to give you a word. Say Rochester. And you would say? Bonk Central. Okay. I say water. You say? Liquid. Okay. I say? I, I say life. Oh, so we're still going? Microorganisms. I say astronaut. Me. Tiger. Rawr. Podcasts. Be heard. Opportunity. Take it. Minnesota. Burr. Midwest. Farmer Joe. Entrepreneurship. Don't do it. Growth. Keep stunting. All right, dude. I think I, I think we did it. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was the game. Dude, let's keep going, man. Okay. Oh on, shit. You, uh, family. Love. Legacy. What I'm about. Color. I don't see it. Old school. Sorry, that's two words. Old. I've been hitting with three words. Old. Oh, uh, saggy balls. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. New. Smells good. Mm. Technology. Future. Future. Perspective. Travel. Hyped. Beer. (laughs) Say theater? I said beer. Me. Beer me. Beer you. (laughs) Yeah. There you go. Phones. Hello. (laughs) Housekeeping. Housekeeping, want me fluff your pillow? You gotta finish it. Housekeeping. What's the What's the finish? You've never seen Tommy, uh, Tommy Boy. Boy. Yeah. Oh. Uh, housekeeping, want me fluff your pillow? Housekeeping, want me? <laughs> Jerk you off? Come <laughs> on, you guys. Jeez, Sorry. that's we, a cult classic. Yeah, we blow it. That's fat, my fault. Fat guy in a little coat. That's the one I would. Have. He comes fat in there right after guy that. Guy in little coat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sing it every single time I put my park on. My wife loves it. Yo, where, first off, where did you get that game? Dude? I was, I was just certain you had like come up with a game in the show notes, and I was like, I gotta find one, man. And you found it. That yeah. shit was hilarious. Mm-hmm. I love it. I play. I do uh, five greatest inventions. Okay, dude, Theo Vaughn. I'll be releasing that podcast next week. He actually came up with five inventions. I, bro, and he was on it too. Okay, so typically what I do is like one of mine is Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre brought us so much. I know he's more or less an inventor, not an invention, Mm -hmm. but he brought us a lot. Things like uh, people, a lot of people say internet, technology, cell phones, airplanes, so we can travel. Theo Vaughn, people got to tune into that because he actually came up with inventions out of his head. Bro, one of them, I'll drop one of them. It was an umbrella. That would catch the water and you could drink the water out of the umbrella or something like that and it would filter it. And he's coming just like that, yeah. snap of the fingers. Dude, that, if you can, like, one word Theo Vaughn is quick-witted thinker. Like, yep. dude, he is quick. I had never heard of him until their event and Declan showed me him. Uh, dude is fire. Like, he is quick. 
Like, and he does it on stage too. Yeah. Like he will just walk around, and then he'll talk. It's like boom story. Then it's like boom. Let's relate it to something that just came into my head and tie it all together. Like the guy. Is awesome and I love that quick witted because I try and do it myself. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were talking earlier about like screwing around on Instagram. Like, yeah, I bagged social or uh, bagged Snapchat and I knew I bagged Snapchat when I stopped saving streaks. Mm -hmm. Now I'm over here in the Instagram world on the live streets of Instagram and I'm just screwing around now on uh, on my story. Hold on, are you done with Snapchat? I'm not officially done. You know, I still use it as a form of communication, but like, I'm I'm pretty much out, bro. Bro, it's not. I'm not feeling it anymore, man. The filters have played out. I like creating characters on there, um, and I like when I'm on the road, utilizing it. But at the same time, man, it's just it's not as user friendly with the connectivity with mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook, one and the other. You don't have to save and then transition over. I wonder what's going to happen there um, with the advertisement game as well. They're going to have to do something uh, extremely different out of out of uh, the blue. Yeah, I totally agree. the business besides the social interaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. like, well, and what also got me too was, you know, once we started the podcast, getting into analytics and understanding like how your stuff is, you know, received. Like Snapchat, dude, once, when they changed their whole platform to where your stories, like you, they weren't just right across the top. No one watches your story anymore. Dude. Stupid. But guess how many mm -hmm. people, half of my followers on my Instagram watch my story. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I'm going to screw around on Snapchat mm -hmm. or on Instagram, dude. I was doing yoga the other day, and I, and I was just thinking, so there's this girl who's just famous, yoga with Adrienne. If, you, if you're a morning after, if you're a yoga person but can't get to the... Uh, the studio, you know, you got to go to Adrienne. She's phenomenal. Yeah, really? Yeah, what, she's and got, like, she guides you through it. She guides you through um, it. And it's yeah. nice and sl it's not like too hectic where you're just like out here sweating. Yeah. You will be if you do some of them, but some of them are just like smart, really like yeah. body movements that you need to incorporate. And it's YouTube, so it's free. Right. right. Huge. right here, so dog. here I am. So here I am doing this yoga. Adriana? Yep. Mm -hmm. You got it, dude. So she's just guiding me through the most intense yoga positions and i am just the most obedient dog-like creature just sweating my ass off and just obedience was the main word and and she just made me like a shark in the water dude you know i meant to be there a, a lion in the jungle so i just started playing around like all right what was i like reflecting on it trying to be like the ovine like what was i, I was like Man, I, I was a shark in the water. She unlocked another version of myself, bro. It was nuts, dude. <laughs> bro, bro. <laughs> like that, but that's that, that. Like that's the theovonomy right there. Like he brings out that like that. It's almost force wit, that but now. I'm getting better at it, dude. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's just more fun. I have a blast just ranting back and forth with someone and just spitballing, dude. Like that's one of my favorite things to do nowadays. Yeah, Theo loves Minnesota. We're lucky. He is uh, definitely an ambassador of our state. Everything worked out, and I think that's kind of um, this deep belief when we have it in ourselves. Things just fall into place, mm -hmm. you know, and I, that's kind of a, a big thing with me early on in the podcast world where it's like, man, I don't want to go, but there's a reason why I need to go. I've got to go have this conversation with this council member or this mayor to be because that, that was my podcast early on where I'm having these. I'm just climbing up the totem pole. Having these conversations that I don't necessarily want to have, but locally can go viral. And a lot of the times it did, you know, where we're pumping out a lot of views every single month uh, organically and no promotion at really at all. And then um, we're building our local clout. And uh, I'll never forget July 20th. It was two days before my wedding. And... <laughs> We get asked by KAL. I had to get vetted through our local news station, which is kind of the the Michael Jordan of news stations in our city. I had to get vetted. They're like, what? You want to come interview Carson Forsman and Laura Lee? Laura Lee? Here to take jobs again. Um, but that's the night I created. Uh, I left. I had a stand up at Thursday, Thursdays on First where we're selling clothes. And I left it to my wife and my cousin to run. And I just created this. Uh, I went and picked up this wig. I picked up this mustache. And I threw on this old douchebag of a suit. And I just uh, made. I walked in and I had my videographer with me. And they didn't know I was doing this. They vetted me twice. They, they're they like, you're not going to swear, right? You're going to be professional, right? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. They didn't know I was going to bring Burt Wellington to the party. So I called him. Uh, he's uh, <laughs> Ron Burgundy's drunk uncle. 
Burt Wellington here to take jobs again tonight at 10. So I went in there and I had Laura Lee. I call her Linda Lee. Um, I had her doing my makeup and stuff. And um, pretty much, bro, we just it just like grew its own legs. You know, little things like that when you create characters. Um, that's what made Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live so big. Where it's like, bro, these off-the-collar characters that are like higher versions of yourself where it's like you know what i am a used car salesman in my soul i am a douchebag you know (laughs) let me do it but it's not really me you know and little things like that where you have to spice it up a little bit and that's basically what i'm getting at is like i get bored easily that blabber is always there that add mother trucker is always there he gets bored i'm surprised we went longer than 45 minutes um because it gets boring, you mm-hmm. know, so I got to spice it up a little bit. So we'll bring in a zoologist where it's like I make sure my co host tell me she can't bring a snake, but I make sure she brings a snake so we can spice it up. And I make sure she gives it to me and I just let it go on the floor. You know what I'm saying? So my boys are hopping up on the chair because I got to make shit interesting. Dude, that's my life, you know, and that's where travel comes into play like we were talking about earlier in the show. The most boring people don't travel, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. The ones we want to hang with are the travelers, where they're just getting up and going. They're not making excuses why they can't go to their boy's wedding down in Dallas, Texas. They're just going, you know, and moments come out of it. So Take action, man. Take action, baby. Mm -hmm. I love it. So we got two final questions. We could talk for hours. I got two final answers. All right. The, The first one puts the ball in your court, and it's one of our favorite. It's just... Do you have any questions for us? Because we just spoke for an hour, and we asked you a ton of questions. We'd love to hear if you have any uh, in return. The fields you're working in right now for a career, did you major in that in college? Well, we're majoring as podcast. Well, the career we're in right now is podcasting, and an engineering degree does not necessarily warrant or prepare you for a podcast degree or a podcast job or a business job or starting a business. That's one great answer, you big boy. Yeah, you smart talker. Um, so I uh, business communications and business management, a business guy over here, you know, here to make money. Uh, but uh, podcast, you could say, has plays a role in there. Not necessarily. Um, what I'm doing for to make money, I work at Life's a Beach Lake Cleanup with my brother. Yeah, we uh, do lake weed removal in Lake Minnetonka. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. I do that from nine to five or nine to four, whatever. How many houses, depending, we have? Dude, you got job security there. We job got secu- plenty, plenty of lakes. Exactly. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't major in it, and uh, I don't think. I think what you're getting at is you don't necessarily need to major in the career that you a- actually want to pursue. Yeah. Um, it all comes down to what you've been preaching this whole podcast. And that and is trust in yourself yeah, and totally buying agree. in. I think like I, I'm preparing myself for this question. Like, you're an engineering major. Why did you get into podcasting and why did you start it? And then why is this your career now? Engineering, you know, I was good at it, not to brag. I I succeeded, did very well. And I could have gotten, like, a sweet engineering job and I would have loved it. I'm not, I would not deny that one bit. But engineering taught me problem solving and just throwing your freaking body on the wall and battling. And figuring it out at every single step because when you have an engineering problem and Matt talked about this on our last podcast, it's very, it's not like you do one thing and it gives you the answer and now you know how to do other things. It's like, no, you do one thing and that's the first layer and there's 75 layers. And then at the end of that, you'll have somewhat of an answer. And that that's the same thing with, I feel like entrepreneurship, podcasting. It's like, dude, we started with buying a mic from Best Buy for $45, that blue microphone sitting in the corner over there. God bless it for the last month, year and four months. It took us another two months to figure out what an RSS feed in was to get on, and to host our own website and get it on iTunes. It took us another, I would argue, the remainder of that semester and all of summer to figure out a process what's going to hit as far as content, how to perform that content, all this other stuff. And, you know, it's it's just going to keep going. But now I know how to do that. It, like go like Facebook ads. You know, Gary Vee talked about how important it was. I started at the surface level of like I don't know what the hell this is. Now I kind of understand it. So just me being able that pr- constant practice of problem solving, Andrew doing the same thing, it's just that's how we do it. And it's – beneficial and it's helped that college degree helped me do this now 
Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Yeah. You guys have your house uh, fantasy football draft this Saturday? Yes. Do you know the order of picks yet? We do not randomize an hour before. Hour before? Mm-hmm. Who are you gunning for, big boy? Declan? Ooh. Either Alvin Kamara or DeAndre Hopkins. Oh, so you're looking for a 5 to 10 pick? Yep. All right. How about you, Andrew? Uh, the and Sarah household, my last name, Andrew and Sarah. We are deeply rooted in the black and yellow, the Berg. That's where the family Ooh. came off the boat. You got a couple up. options then. I got a couple options. I mm-hmm. could go running back. I could go wide receiver. Yeah. I'm going to stick with my go-to, and it's Antonio Brown. Mm-hmm. Tony Two Tat. Tony Two Tat. He works. Yep. Dude, he's a beast. Mm-hmm. He's just the best ever. All right, last question. Okay. What did you learn today from the moment you woke up to when we're having this conversation right now? Ooh, I love this. Um, one of my, I typically don't do New Year's resolutions, but I knew I had a daughter on the way. So I had to, I'm not a, I'm an impatient person. It's my money and I want it now. And every single day, man, I am really trying to harness the ability to be patient. And every single day I get better at it. So today I woke up to a um, blowout. My daughter, I've got, uh, I've got these guys moving in um moving in a new dryer we got okay so i got that i got my german shepherd out front tied up barking at him left and right i've got to do my breath work and i've got to hone it in and i've got to be patient and i know that these guys are probably going to take an hour hooking it up and stuff my daughter's going to be up in like 25 minutes so i went in and i knew she was all wet and this is something where it's typical but it's not always a zoo where I got my cat trying to sneak outside while they move in. She's a psychopath. I've got my dog out front being a butthole. <laughs> and then I got my daughter who had a literal explosion all the way up her back. So that's what you call an Insta bath. It was yellow. Insta-bath. It looked like uh, I could break it down. No, do not. <laughs> yeah, do not. I can't well, handle that right no. now, dude. <laughs> it, it, it looked. Bro, it was bad. But anyways, <laughs> so it's things like that. But like when you have a zoo going on around you and um, you just, bro, you're able to just hone it in and focus on patience on a daily basis. So I will never quit trying to sharpen that sword when it comes to patience. And I learn on a daily basis, bro. Being a father, a first time father, I've only been married for a year and I just really start, um, I'm learning a lot about um, civility within a household keeping it reined in um one thing about me is i don't put my family online um and i didn't even know gary didn't do that i just knew joe rogan didn't do that so i just i thought i think it's tacky when people are overexposing their little human beings they create or overexposing the love for their significant other i think man when you give it all to the world what's left at home you know what i'm saying and that's something where i really I, my wife and I weren't even Facebook official until the day we got married. You know, we were together for five years prior to that. People have still never seen my daughter. And she's the cutest little bean ever. But yes, I'll show you a picture. I'll send you a picture. I'm just not putting it out for the world to see. I think it's weird. I think it is. We're so addicted to these red bubbles that pop up that you are using my daughter. Like I've had to have, to have this conversation with her aunts and um, one of her grandparents where it's like, no, I don't care. You are my daughter is being used for your red bubble addiction. That ain't gonna fly. Cause no matter what, if you can't cherish that moment, you're putting it out to the ether so you can grab attention from it, from it. And that's not the world. That's not where the internet is going. The internet is going to. You better be providing value to everyone. Your live videos, everything better have a point to it. Because what do we do when we see the same old person who always goes live, they never provide value? What do we do? We keep scrolling. We don't even tune in anymore. They're not providing value from the jump. I don't care if you have a 19-minute long video. As long as I can grab one gem out of that, I'm good. And I know what I'll get next time too. When people obsess over posting their, their kids online, I can no longer tune into what you provide. Because... I don't care about your kids. Yeah, they're cute as hell. That's awesome. I hope they succeed in life. But I truly do not care about your kids. Get my drift? Absolutely. Like your boss at work. You don't care about that little Johnny hit a home run at baseball? That's cool, but you ain't got to come to work and tell me about it because I don't care. I'm too focused on mine. 
we are selfish whether we want to admit it or not. And we have to be selfish so we can provide value to our teammates. I have a quick question, actually, just going right off of that. I know we're going a little over, but yeah. we're never actually going over on yeah. this podcast. It's our podcast. Yes. My dad told me this one time, and it was like, dude, it's stuck with me since the day he told me. He goes, when you have a kid, it, it's the biggest transition in your life because you transition from it being all about you mm-hmm. to it being all about your kid. What is that like? All my homies, all my boys would try to tell me what it was like because they beat me to the to the dance. They A lot of them had kids prior to me, and they would always tell me. They would give me precursors. Anything anyone ever tells you about having a child, throw it out the window. One thing my boy, my best man in my wedding, my one of my best friends, he told me, Nick, be pre- prepared for your heart to live outside of your body. That was one thing that stood true. My heart now lives outside my body. It's no longer my heart beating. It's her heart within me and her heart beating over there. And that is my heart, you know, and it's something that that's really stuck with me to the point where nothing matters. That little girl is on my mind all the time. Every decision I make is due to her. Every risk I take is because of her. It's for her. She needs to know, and that brings up legacy. So if I live this basic bitch life and I do my thing, that will be awesome. And she might get a pension out of it, a long-term long-term um, financial gain out of daddy building, building something, um, playing this, going the safe route, playing it safe. But is my legacy that I didn't leave ever going to be a benefit to her? She needs to know that when their name in parks after me, or my company, or whatever, that she will always be able to hang her hat on that. That'll be a resume builder for her. Get my drift? Because I know how fast this planet's moving. So we're graduating from school. School is going to be like um, further education, and the form it's in now is going to be irrelevant when my daughter's graduating from high school in 18 years. It's going to be a whole different ballgame. It's going to be all about what the hell did dad built, and how did he how did he set me up? It's not like the old head's... It's shape shifting. Everything is shape shifting right now, and we need to be so aware of it. We need to play this. It's beyond playing the game of chess of life. We need to start realizing that we are swimming uphill backwards with a blindfold on. Now, to put that into perspective, we ain't got a clue. We have no clue. So it's all about living in this moment right now, putting one step in, one foot in front of the other, and making steady gains on a daily basis. So when we wake up, we learn every single day. We learn something new. We learn about RSS feed. We learn how to build our own website. We we create this team that's going to be an absolute asset, an absolute benefit so they can salvage our time. They can salvage our energy. And as long as I'm my team is salvaging me energy and me time, that's where I'm going to be able to set my daughter up. That's where I'm going to be able to read her more Dr. Seuss. That, that way... I'm going to be having her write her own Dr. Seuss books by the time she's five. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to keep my daughter off the internet. I'm going to get her to the point where she, when she's ready to start her own YouTube channel and she's going to be able to provide value to the world and get her clicks up, that's where she's going to be able to do it herself. Get my drift? Yes. And it's all about that. We need to be focusing on providing value to this planet as opposed to being a waste of space. And I guess that's what I'm getting at because there are way too many people who have basic bitch syndrome, who are wasting space. And I ain't got time for it. And I don't mean to come off as a dick. I just know what's happening. And it's eating up my timeline. <laughs> it's eating up my news feed. Um, and that's why I like what the back pocket's doing because your guys' questions are actually tapping into something deeper and it cultivates further conversation that I want to have. So thank that. you. No, thank you so much, Nick. Stationary astronaut, guest of the back pocket. Man, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on our show. Definitely want to add anything to that? We cultivated heat, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, that was the most heat cultivated from these mics ever. And I was on Planet Nine the entire time, dude. And I love it. I can't wait to keep doing this again and again. And I can't wait to, you know, I can't wait to actually send it to, like, ten of the mo- people that I think would listen to it and have them listen to this because it's important. There's so much shit that we tapped into on this podcast. It's unbelievable. And and it's funny because, you know, Gary always talks about throwing the 98 or only 2% taking it back. I'm excited for the 2% to get back to me and talk to us about it. So thanks for coming out, man.
And that was our interview with Stationary Astronaut. If you're still with us and you're like, what the hell was that? I just want to apologize from the back pocket end. We had such a great time. We were in such a present moment. We blacked out. I want to give you guys our takeaways right now, but I really can't because there was so much. And I think I just, I, it was one of those experience, out of body experiences where I was like, I am so locked in that I could see myself above us. And I was like, holy smokes, this is a real, this is real. Yeah. There was a dog in the room. And at one point I felt like I was the dog. So, so we got that going for us, dude. Like, it was very much out of body. A lot of good chakra. I think that's the right way to use it. Absolutely. Um, but anyways, dude. We yeah. had five people. No, we had s- six. We had six people and a dog. Yeah, in this room at one in point. In the room. So it was, wow. it was a lot going on. Thank you, Nick, for coming on. Truly appreciated your time. And I hope our marketing interns enjoy it. Please uh, check out our Golden Nugget blog that we'll be posting tomorrow, um, September 18th. And uh, you'll see our actual takeaways in written fashion. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's trap the puck and move on to the back end. The back end is uh, our favorite part. You guys know this. You know the drill. I love this part. We're at our best. Marketing interns that have made it this far, you are a tier above the rest. Thank you, marketing interns. You guys are literally the best who have made it this far. I mean, all the marketing interns are great. I said that totally wrong, but thank you. Absolutely. So what do we start with is a what did you learn? Declan, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I'll I'll get it going. So this was something that I learned kind of on my own, but through the reinforcement of, you know, the mindset of get stuff done. Get stuff done. You got this. I got this, right? You got this. So I find myself on social media and my friends and family can attend to this. I'm on social media a lot. It is sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. It creates a lot of opportunities for the back pocket, and I like the back pocket, so mm. therefore I like social media. I just realized where you're going to go with this, and marketing interns lock in. Let's go, let's go, sorry. sorry. So so I'm on social media a lot, right? And I want to get stuff done. Mm. How, do I, how do I manipulate or how do I get myself better? Optimize. Optimize, thank you. How do I optimize my time on social media? And so then I was like, okay, instead of scrolling through social media. So let's use Instagram. Instead of scrolling through Instagram, I'm searching on Instagram. I'm searching for a way to provide value to someone else in the comment section, on our story, whether it's a like. Anytime I do that, I'm providing value to that person. So when I see Gary Vee posts, when I see Tim Ferriss posts, Tom Bilyeu, all these different people, Austin Doomer, you know, you even just random people. If I see it and I like it, like physically like it, not just double tap, then I will provide value to you. I will comment on it. I will try and give some feedback. I will DM you and say, this was awesome. That to me is more a productive time than just scrolling on Instagram. Phenomenal, dude. You told me told me this on our bike ride the other day and I was like, I'm doing it. You, let, you, you sold me. And it's just a different mindset, but you're doing the same thing. You're still mindlessly on Instagram, but you're like, okay, you, if you can document that you're on Instagram. One would say you are now being mindful. Mindful. Thank you. Instead of being mindless. Love that, man. Um, so marketing interns, if you, if you choose to uh, go the route of finding value on the Instagram page while you're on it, or Twitter, or Facebook, or LinkedIn, uh, let us know how it goes. Leave, yeah, uh, leave absolutely. some comments. Absolutely. Uh, what did I learn? I learned through a little experience that I had getting my hair cut over at Goodfellas. On good wa- fellas, on shout out good fellas. Yeah, good fellas. Uh, Where are they at? Washington, 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 and uh, Minneapolis. I my, didn't know my barber. I've been there probably three or four times now, but this is the first time I had this guy, and uh, his energy was awesome. A lot of passion coming at me right away, and I could have resisted and be like, "Dude, I'm just trying to get a haircut. Like, let me be." But I like took this opportunity to like what you're talking about, provide value in someone's life. Mm-hmm. He was being passionate. I wanted to return the favor. And him and I were filling up the entire barbershop with our voices. Like we were just going in on conversations. And we had other people from across the room talking about our conversation like with us. Like chiming in. Chiming in. Nice. It was the coolest experience. There was eight people in there. So four barbers, four people getting their hair cut. No, nobody waiting. It would have been funny if there was someone waiting and they were in it too. But it was just four. It was eight of us. And we were all just having banter back and forth hilarious experience i walked out of there huge smile i grabbed his business card nick callis um castellano um at goodfellas total stud go there 
and it, try to experience the same thing I did because I just was fully enlightened for the rest of my day and my mood was enhanced. All right, thank you, good fellas, for that's providing so cool. that. That's so cool. Do you think that's why like the show Barbershop is is big? Like, do you think that was founded off of the idea of what you just experienced? Um, I think people are comfortable in that situation. Usually you have someone cutting your hair that you, you've had for a long time. Shout out Mrs. Lorch and Austin Lorch. And that experience provides just like a, an opportunity to have a conversation with someone you mm-hmm. get to catch up with all the time. And I think that was their intention. Absolutely. Okay. I like that. That's but, just, I've never really had that experience before. I've always just kind of gone to different hairstylists and got your hair cut and then yeah, left. Yeah. And basically just trying to figure out a way to not spend a lot of money on my hair. Yeah. So. Anyways, we can talk about my haircuts later on. One cool thing about my haircuts, actually, is I've only gotten haircuts in Colorado. Like, it, it's a quarterly thing for me. Right. But anyways, feel-good story. We're wrapping it up here in, a, in an important way. So this feel-good story is a little arbitrary, but we want to get into it. And these are all for the people who have failed and failed miserably and have done something wrong, and they know it. But at the same time, you got this. You got this, dude. Think about all the times that we've failed on this podcast. We can go into detail, but you guys know by now. And I and and I've failed in other ways and I've identified those things, but you've got to understand these are just learning moments and learning and another opportunity to grow. Andrew, what was what what do you call failures? Um, an opportunity or an outcome that you didn't expect. There you go. An outcome you didn't expect. Here's, here's our message for those people, and this is, should leave you on a good note. Leverage those outcomes or leverage the, those situations, these failures, and turn them into something different. Turn them into learn from it, triple down on it, grow from it. And I think you're going to be in a better spot just consistently trying to get better every day. Focus on your process and accomplish those small tasks. Find the light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. You might need to blow up dynamite to find it. It could be an an extreme situation. And if it is, we're here for you guys. But if it's small and minute, look inside. Look at those people around you. Find the light at the end of the tunnel. Boom. You got this. Next week, Podcast 67. Walter Bond, U of M, basketball star, NBA player, now motivational speaker. He's a shark, but he's also a sucker fish, boy. So see you later, suckers. Podcast 67 next week. Dick care. Dick care.